Sammy. Thank y'all so much. It really is an honor for me to get to do this and to get to be with y'all. Um, this morning, what I want to do is look at Psalm 32. So if you want to follow along with me, we're going to be looking at Psalm 32. And thinking about, um, I'm thinking about Psalm 32, Jason mentioned resolutions. Um, I'm not a big resolution guy. But I think the invitation of Psalm 32 is that maybe the, one of the better ways to reflect in 2023 as we move into 2024 is thinking about the joy and the grace of repentance. Um, Psalm 32, let me start, read the whole thing. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you. And I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle or will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright. In heart. Let me pray for us, and then I want to just spend a little bit of time meditating in Psalm 32 this morning. Let me pray for us first. Our Lord, we thank you for the Psalms. We thank you that they give a voice and uh, words and shape to all of the emotions and feelings and shame and guilt and sin that we know and carry. Lord, I thank you for Psalm 32. I thank you for this gift that invites us to admit the truth about who we really are as a sinful people, a broken people in need of a great salvation. But I thank you for Psalm 32 because it is an invitation as we confess our sin to you, O Lord, to see in the life of David, to see the way in which you meet us with a greater grace, a grace that is always greater than all of our sin. Lord, I pray that you would meet us in that way this morning. I, I, don't pret- I know what I carry this morning. I, I don't pretend to know what each one carries this morning, but you know. Lord, I thank you that you know us. You really do. And you love us. And you sent, Father, you sent your son Jesus for us to be our righteousness. And so, Lord, I pray that you would meet us in that way this morning. We pray these things, Lord Christ, in your name. Amen. So I grew up uh, in a family that really loved, my dad was a big music guy, and I can remember, I, I, I'm 43, so I can remember getting my first mixtape, and on the front side was some, were some hits off of Tom Petty's Full Moon Fever, great album, and on the back side were some tracks, just various Billy Joel tracks, and there was one in particular, one song, that always Billy Joel songs that stayed with me, uh, it's called Only the Good Die Young, and there's a, a line in that song where he says, I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints. Psalm 32 is an invitation to cry with the saints, to cry over our sin, to cry over the hard truths when we really look ourselves in the mirror by God's grace and see ourselves as he sees us. But the paradox, the oxymoron, is that the way of the Lord, the way of grace, that as we do that, we find a greater grace and a greater joy. And so what I want to do this morning is simply, there are two movements in Psalm 32. I want to do it really simply. The first is David. We, we get to watch him admitting 
the guilt of his sin. And then the second movement we get to see is we get to also watch him begin to try to accept and receive the grace of this God that he knows and loves. So think with me for a second about the first movement that David is, is admitting, uh, the admission of guilt. What I love about Psalm 32 is that David uses four words to try to describe his sin. Uh, four words to try to get at what does it mean when we say we are sinners in need of salvation. And we'll take them one by one. They're in the first two verses. That first word, transgression, in the Hebrew it means something more, and again, I'm not a scholar, but I have, but I have studied Uh, In the Hebrew, it means something more like willful or deliberate rebellion. So we can think of God's words in Isaiah 1. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. One of the ways that I I like to try to get at this is is just to ask this question. What is the worst thing that you ever did towards your parents? Mine's pretty clear. and, And stay with me. It's a little bit heavy. So part of how I became a Christian is my dad left our family through drug addiction when I was uh, in middle school. And in about seventh grade, my mom either became a Christian in that time or got renewed as a Christian in that time. I I don't really know. But she was very set that I would join her for Christian counseling. And as a seventh grader, angry, depressed, trying to make sense of dad is gone, parents are split, trying to understand what was going on with my dad. Uh, I can remember this one fateful day where she was, was struggling with me. Um, you, you're going to counseling today. You're going to see the counselor today. And I was like, no, I am not going to see the counselor today. And she came, she was in my room. And she said, get in the car. We're going to see the counselor. And I said, no, I'm not going to see the counselor. And then one, one last time she said, get in the car. We're going to see the counselor. And I vividly remember this. I reached into my closet And I picked up an Easton baseball bat, and I held it up, and I said, I'm not going anywhere. And of course, she burst into tears. I eventually burst into tears. Hard family. Family's fun. Am I right? right? But it's a moment for me. it's It's a small glimpse of what it means that we've rebelled against the Lord, where we have in our hearts along the way said, I will not do what you have asked me to do. David is saying, that's me. Transgression. Then he keeps moving. This is the dark part, by the way. Uh, It gets better, but just hang with me in the dark part. The second word he uses is just the word sin. Again, in the Hebrew, it means something like to miss the mark or fall short. So if you grew up, if you went to BBS, you know the Romans road of salvation. That's where Paul picks it up, Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I like this idea, or I think this idea is important, that we have fallen short of what we should be. That's what David is trying to own and say. He can say it like this. I wasn't the husband that I should have been. The psalm is, if you know the story, out of his great adultery with Bathsheba. I wasn't the husband that I should have been. I wasn't the father that I should have been. I wasn't the leader that I should have been. I wasn't the believer that I should have been. And can't we say the same? I'm not the husband. We're celebrating 20 years. It was beautiful. Our students actually donated to to pay for us to have this beautiful dinner. It was awesome. But I know the feeling of not being the husband that I should be, of not being the father that I should be to, to send my first to college and know and try to own as much as I can and say sorry for as much as I can of the ways that I felt short, the friend that I should be, the son that I should be, the neighbor that I should be, the co-worker that I should be, the cousin that I should be, the nephew that I should be. David is naming, I think, if we're being honest, we know and feel that I have fallen short. I have fallen short of what I was made and meant to be, and then he keeps going. The third word he he chooses and uses to try to own his sin is iniquity. It means something like to be twisted or bent out of shape. Again, Ezekiel 16 gets at it where the Lord says, Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her sisters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. 
I love, I'm a C.S. Lewis nerd a little bit. Uh, when I became a Christian, all of his works, Mere Christianity in particular, meant a, a whole lot to me. Narnia is one of my favorites. I, I tried to do this, the Space Trilogy and got just far enough for this one illustration, basically. Um, in the first book of the, of the Space Trilogy, there's this, if you remember the story or know the story, these two men have come to this planet in space, and their whole goal is to rate it of its resources and come back to Earth and to just become rich. And there's this fateful scene toward the end where this kind of Christ-like figure named Oyarsa sees through what these men are doing, and he calls this kind of tribunal council and confronts the men. And there's this line that Lewis uses through this, this Oyarsa character where he's looking at these men, and he says this, there is a bentness, there is a bentness in the human race. I like the way that Luther would try to come at it, where he would say, we were, we were made, meant to be curved outward in love to God and in love to one another. And what David is saying, what sin does to you and me is it curves us inward on ourselves, where the way I like to say it with my kids and with my students is, I have a superpower, and you do too, and that superpower is the ability to make everything and anything about me. I can make this about me <laughs> and be so turned in on myself where I don't really care about how the Lord might be meeting you through these words and texts, but it's all about me. How am I performing? How am I doing? We have this, David is saying, we have this superpower where everything, my ability to make it all about me is massive and devastating. There's a fitness in me. And then that last word that he uses is that word deceit, which just means duplicity or dishonesty or pretense. In the, another place in, in Psalm 101 that, that tries to name it is the Lord saying, No one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. Uh, big TV guy. Like when people ask me, what are your hobbies? If I'm being honest, I'm like, I just watch a lot of TV. Um, yeah. And uh, Breaking Bad is top ten, maybe top five for me if you watch Breaking Bad with Walter White. But there was this interview by Vince Gilligan, the creator of Breaking Bad, that was trying to describe, so if you know the story of Breaking Bad, you're watching this high school chemistry teacher become, by the end of it, this is, I guess, a spoiler, but it's been out a long time, uh, become just this monstrous drug dealer, killer of a man. And they were asking Gilligan about that journey, where you watch someone who seems pretty innocent and good become someone by the end of, of the show, very scary, and very, um, yeah, just scary. And here's what he said. He said, I don't think he's talking about Walter White. He said, I don't think he's an evil man. He's an extremely self-deluded man. We always say in the writer's room, if Walter White has a true superpower, it's not his knowledge of chemistry or his intellect. It's his ability to lie to himself. He is the world's greatest liar. He could lie to the Pope. He could lie to Mother Teresa. He certainly could lie to his family, and he can lie to himself, and he can make these lies stick. He can make himself believe, in the face of all contrary evidence, that he is still a good man. It really does feel to us like a natural progression down this road to hell, which was originally paved with good intention. David is using these four words. He's grabbing all the words he can in his native tongue to say one thing about himself. I am a sinner through and through, and there is nothing I can do to save myself. It reminds me of, if you're a Les Mis person, it reminds me of the great song in Les Mis, Who Am I? You know the story of Les Mis where Jean Valjean, uh, he's caught stealing uh, the candlesticks by, by uh, Javert, and the priest says they were a gift, and, 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 and Valjean's life has really changed. He, he, he enters into this new life where he's trying to live righteously, but then the news comes to him years later that Javert has found the man that he thinks is, is Valjean, and Valjean is wrestling with, do I go and present myself to the court? Do I go and, and say that I'm the real Valjean? You know, it's me, and I'm not going to sing it for us because that would just crush us all, but it, I'll read it for us. Uh, he, this is where the great song, Who Am I, it comes into Les Mis, and here's how it goes, if you remember it. Who am I? Can I conceal myself forevermore? Pretend I'm not the man I was before, and must my name until I die be no more than an alibi, must I lie? 
How can I ever face my fellow man? How can I ever face myself again? My soul belongs to God, I know. I made that bargain long ago. He gave me hope when hope was gone. He gave me strength to carry on. If you've ever seen it, this is one of my favorite scenes. Who am I? And he begins to unbutton or rip his shirt. Who am I? Who am I? And then he reveals the prison numbers on his chest. 24601. I say to my kids, this is the only tattoo. At some point at 43, you accept maybe I'm not a tattoo guy. But if I were to be, this is a 24601. Because what's he doing? He's doing what David is doing. He's saying, Lord, you know the truth about who I am. You know the truth about what I've done. I confess to you my brokenness. I confess to you the things that keep me up at night. I confess to you in thought, word, and deed how short I fall, how selfish I am, how, how my heart still runs after so many idols. from us. He doesn't hold them over us. He's not the spouse that, that I am. He doesn't hold our sins, our transgressions over us. He carries them away. The second word, he covers our sins again and it means to conceal or to provide for. I love the image from Micah 7 where he says, I will again have compassion on you. I will tread your
to a place of faith in the future of what the way that God's salvation is going to come, we know how it ends. We know what David's greater son was like. We know that when David is saying, when I covered my son, I was miserable and depressed, when I confessed it freely, he covered it, and I began to know real joy, joy of forgiveness. We can think about the Lord. He's the one who carries our sins away. We know what David was putting his looking toward. We know the way that he counted not our sins against us, but he counted his righteousness toward us and our sins against him. He died the death that we deserve to die and lived the life that we could never live. We know that once he ascended, that he did give us a right spirit by giving us his spirit, who does lead us to honesty and humility. We know that would, that the grace, this greater grace that David is talking about has been fulfilled forever, fully, finally, eternally by our Lord Jesus. I'll close with this. One of my, my favorite movies of all time, animated film from the 90s called The Iron Giant. If you've never seen it, the story is pretty simple. It's set in the Cold War. It's set kind of in the fifth, right in the late 50s when, when, when tensions were high between Russia and the U.S. and Strange thing happens, there's this little boy, Hogarth, living with a single mom, and he's out playing in the woods one day, and this giant, this iron giant, falls from the sky down in this woods right near his house. And Hogarth kind of helps save the giant from being electrocuted, and they develop this friendship. But as the story goes, the U.S. military, this one general in particular, they've, they've heard word about this giant who's just parading about town, and they're convinced this must be some kind of Russian spy. So as the story builds, this one general calls in all of the troops. They're going to hunt this giant, and they're going to kill this giant because they're afraid that he's a Russian spy. And as the movie gets to its crescendo, this general has brought the tanks and the missiles, and they chase this giant into town square, but a lot of people are gathering to watch the spectacle. And without thinking, this general fires a missile to kill the giant, and as the missile is in the air, the giant does this beautiful thing. He flies up, he looks at the people, he looks at his friend Hogarth, and then he flies into the sky, and just as the missile gets to the upper reaches, this giant takes the missile into himself. And right before he does it, he smiles. And then he explodes into a thousand pieces. And I love the way that, that Tim Keller says this. He says, it's Hebrews 12, where it says about Jesus that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. What was that joy? That joy was you, and that joy was me, that the Lord Jesus went to the cross for the joy of redeeming sinners like David, the joy of loving and redeeming sinners like you and me. I, I love the way that George Herbert says it. He says that liquor, that liquor sweet and most divine Thou knew his blood, but I was wine. It's a good word as we come to the table. Let me pray for us. Our Lord, we thank you for a, a grace that meets us in all of our sin. Sin that's been confessed, sin that's still hidden. Lord, would you lead us to the grace of confession and repentance. Lord, sin that, that feels so old still besets us and confuses us and frustrates us, Lord, you know, and it is still no match for your grace. It's no match for the sanctification and that you are and will do as you make us more like Jesus, and as you do it with joy in us, which you never let us forget our standing 
that your grace is assured and secured for us in the Lord Jesus, that we are forever and fully and finally loved, period. And Lord, from that place of knowing this great grace, would you lead us? Would you lead us in the freedom of your spirit? Would you change us in all of the ways that we need to be changed? Would you strengthen us to be what we need to be, what you called us to be? Would you give us a band of brothers and sisters who walk in this way with us? We need it, Lord. But Lord, I thank you that you need us in this way. Would you, for the first time or for the millionth time, be the lifter of our heads that we might see your face that beams love and joy and grace toward us. We need that, Lord. Would you do that for us through the work of your Spirit? We pray these things through Christ our Lord.